Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Guillermo Varela from Magnil Europe, and I want to introduce today's speaker. Christoph is a Cybercraft architect and professor at the Chair of Design and Construction in Virtual and Augmented Reality. He is the co founder and co director of Cybercraft Colleague. Florian is a civil engineering and structural engineering professor at the OTH. Sebastian is a product designer, robotic fabrication specialist, and cybercrafter. And he's uh, a researcher and lecturer at the Cybercraft Codec and supervises the Cybercraft Cave Architecture Faculty. Mark is an architect, robotic fabrication specialist, and cybercrafter. And he is also a researcher and lecturer at the Cybercraft Codec and supervises the Building Lab. In this webinar, they are going to show us their work at the Cybercraft Institute and demonstrate the benefits of using manual building processes crafts and digital tools. Please remember that you can ask questions in the chat and we can answer them in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Also, the webinar is being recorded and we will upload it to YouTube tomorrow. Thank you again for joining us and please start with the presentation if you're ready. Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you, uh, Bob okay. Magnia. Um, hello, so my name is Christoph Balib and as Guillermo mentioned, I'm Professor for Design Construction and Cybercraft at the OTR Regensburg. And today we intend to share ideas about fusing handcraft and digital crafts to what we call cybercraft. I'm here with my fellow members of the Cybercraft Institute and its associated college uh, based at the OTH Regensburg uh, of the Faculty of Architecture. We have Sebastian Voigt, the Building uh, Engineering Faculty, Market, uh, Mark uh, Schmeitzel and uh, Professor Florian Weininger. We are all claimed to be cybercrafters, uh, and we're happy to share these ideas with you today. Um, together, we, um, we intend to demonstrate that close collaboration between the handcrafts and the digital crafts can lead to new and exciting cybercrafts. I'll explain this image in a few minutes. Um, and at our labs, we also enjoy working, uh, just to mention Bog McNeil a little bit, why we use these tools. Um, we we work with uh, Rhino and Grasshopper quite a bit, and a lot of the community's uh, plugins to sketch, streamline uh, our ideas before hard coding them uh, for various uh, hardware interfaces. Uh, I personally began working with Rhino in the early days, uh, uh, at the millennium turn actually in New York City, and uh, Rhino has always been relatively inexpensive, and yet one of the more powerful computational geometry modeling tools. Um, furthermore, thanks to the commitment that the McNeil uh, community has uh, of avoiding these marketing expenditures and focusing uh, on the community, Rhino has emerged as my one of my tools of choice uh, for simple and complex designs and sketchings and production pipelines. Um, my colleagues and I will demonstrate some of these uh, sketching ideas today in the webinar. They range from research to full-blown customer-orientated products uh, in practice. And we try, uh, strive to make all of these uh, interfaces, human-machine uh, interactions as intuitive as possible so anyone in the workshop can use the, the tools. Um, but firstly, I'd like to introduce a little bit of uh, the ideas behind handcrafts, uh, traditional handcrafts, and the status quo here in Germany. Um, the crafts play a crucial role in furthering our craft and building cultures and to adapt to the overwhelming social and economical environmental transformations that are facing us. Uh, so they will have to uh, be sustained somehow. Um, and uh, since many of you are likely professional students and researchers um, skilled in Rhino uh, and Grasshopper, maybe even developers more than users, uh, I won't dwell too much on the digital crafting cultures what I can say, though, is that over the course of the past 30 years, uh, my experience has been that uh, many handcrafters try to be designers and vice versa. And uh, I have found that actually it's best to stay in the field that you are meant to uh, practice and uh, work together and listen to one another and really try to develop these uh, these new ideas. So we believe that Cybercraft carries that spirit of really collaboration. Um, and uh, a lot of the stuff that you'll see today has only uh, been produced because of putting uh, skilled people together from the hand and the digital crafts. 
Um, I'll introduce uh, also how I identified Cybercraft uh, as a new mode of informa informing uh, materials made possible mainly through high-speed data transmission, cross-platform interfaces, sensors, cloud computing, computer vision, AI, ML, all the VR, AR, MX devices, robotics, etc., and why it's important to grasp which mode of making we practice to negotiate the media agencies. Um, Mark will then feature how we integrate old and new lab robots, because we have a lot of uh, old technology that would be uh, a shame to waste, and uh, will give us an outlook toward some of the new research and ongoing research in our labs. Uh, finally, Sebastian will feature uh, practice-based projects. And after that, we or even, uh, let me put it this way, if you have questions during the uh, presentation, uh, maybe Guillermo, you can just let me know what's in the chat and I'll try to address them. Um, yep, but otherwise, sure. yeah, we'll be happy to discuss uh, at any time. Maybe after is, uh, could be better, but if there's something uh, important, I would be happy to answer it during the presentation. Um, so let me start with hand crabs. As, as some of you may know, at least here in Germany, they're they're flourishing. Yet we have a major problem that we have uh, too few skilled professionals and lack young talent. Um, on a reason being that people aren't so keen on craftsmanship, getting their hands dirty, let's say. Um, so commissions are kind of going astray. Knowledge is definitely being lost as masters retire and that knowledge disappears. And so the mood in the community itself is kind of going down the drain. Um, besides that, there are several economical, environmental, and social and cultural issues that are confronting um, not only the handcrafts, but our entire societies. Um, several uh, handcraft trades have tried uh, investing in uh, robotic technologies, uh, but what often happens is that they find that uh, Robot programming is highly expensive and is usually for serial automation. Robot programs tend to not be flexible and often uh, developed by engineers for engineers and uh, typically require knowledgeable operator. So ultimately, um, what ends up happening is they they see these investments as buying a robot, building an env environment, programming it, training staff, and at the end of the day, it's a lot of disappointment and we're trying to help these people. So what are the new perspectives? Well, we'd like to introduce you to um, Cybercraft. And um, what is Cybercraft? On the left, uh, you see uh, the craftsmanship uh, where people work and design creatively with their hands, minds, and analog tools usually. Uh, and on the right is the industry, which has been working with digital support for quite a long time. And uh, you and I are well versed as digital crafters using software and hardware technologies to rationalize complexity computationally. But with serial uh, production, it, it takes some work to get involved. So most people uh, just want to develop things and above all create unique products at uh, competitive prices. That's why we try to bring the potential of both of these worlds together and we coin uh, it Cybercraft. Um, now, <clears throat> nothing that you'll see today or hear is uh, from us is uh, a claim of anything really new. Uh, I think we've been doing a lot of Cybercrafting for quite some years, but I don't think anybody uh, put the term uh, onto these uh, practices. And uh, so why is this important? because knowing in which sphere you're operating in allows you to work precisely and effectively. And it also permit, per, permits uh, greater media agency and control over the uh, creation process. And so this diagram uh, was developed uh, to, by me to try to reflect on what is actually happening while the practice of crafting things in the analog and in the digital and what happens when they overlap. And this is, the hybrid space where digital and analog emerge. And um, I, I called it Cybercraft for that reason. And we'll see some of the projects that were maybe called digital craft and that I would like uh, in the future, hopefully to be called Cybercraft. Um, so we're gonna show some projects um, that are from uh, the communities um, and we'll show the projects that we're working on um, that are running parallel to some of these things. 
what, so what is Cybercraft capable of here? Um, humans and machines work hand in hand. These are two concrete uh, Cybercraft applications for skilled trade. Uh, the left is uh, humans implementing craft activities with the help of virtual guidance, so blueprints. And, uh, and to the right is a, a robot uh, idea concept where it's an extension of the body and it can learn uh, through um, uh, AI, machine learning and, um, and sensing, and it can implement its own strategies with time. Uh, so in, the, in, an, in essence, uh, a lot of this stuff is made possible by sensing space real time adapting it to it on the fly and enabling creation. So Cybercraft really uses sensor technology to capture that physical environment or phenomena that humans can't perceive with all their senses. And with these digital supporting techniques, uh, we adapt to complex processes in turn uh, to create highly individualized solutions. Um, the following topic uh, is about how the human is very active with these machine technologies. Um, it's based on AI technology. Probably you guys, uh, some of you know Fologram, and I'm showing an example from their portfolio of this brick wall that they made with the University of Tasmania. Um, as you see, you could ask yourself, is this, uh, is this uh, handmade? Um, or is this manufactured? Uh, well, in effect, I would call it cybercraft. It's only possible because of this uh, kind of technology where augmentation uh, enables a, a model to be interfaced onto a, or superimposed in a real environment. Um, and the level of uh, precision of the equipment is, uh, is sophisticatedly high, I think, even though it's new technology and it probably will get very... Um, uh, even better with time. So people are able to quickly and intuitively uh, interact with media and complex geometry to develop a new building uh, strategy. So here, if you were to imagine uh, using standard craft methods to build such a wall, I am pretty convinced you would need quite a few hours just to understand the building process to build the jigs to control it and so on and so forth. So with these augmented technologies, um, it helps a lot. And then the other interesting aspect is if, uh, if you think about it, a lot of young people have been growing up now with digital uh, media um, interfaces, smartphones, mainly iPads, all these kinds of toys but powerful computers at the same time. And, um, and they're interested in, in continuing to be involved in that environment. So we anticipate that um, building practices that uh, implement these technologies could benefit from it, you know, giving them the younger generation uh, an incentive to be part of these uh, traditional building cultures. So no complex machinery is uh, necessary to build this type of wall. It's just uh, basically a design and uh, superimposition superimpo of uh, digital media uh, information. You need some markers and such information. And uh, you probably still want to continue surveying what you're doing. But in principle, it's, it's classical handcraft augmented by digital craft. So we would put this into the category cybercraft. Um, <clears throat> the same here. It's the same, more or less the same experiment. Um, and um, and here's another example that I find quite uh, exciting. I'm sure you all know it as well, the steampunk. Um, to just briefly uh, elaborate these ideas a bit more, uh, here you see these this complex uh, computer rendering of, uh, of these uh, geometrical bands, uh, what are ruled surfaces. And um, the question would be, how would you want to build something like this? And again, thanks to the idea of super, superimposing uh, digital uh, information with real information, uh, real space, this becomes possible. So the digital model gives us all this, these advantages of understanding the complexity of geometries and uh, embedding, uh, encoding some of the material agencies and, um, and also known practices. Uh, what's uh, wonderful about all of this is it doesn't take highly skilled uh, craftsmen uh, to manufacture things, they just need to follow instructions and uh, use tools properly. 
Um, so here we see somebody uh, crafting based on a holographic uh, representation. This is just a superimposition. You you would actually not be seeing this the way it's presented here. Um, and the nice thing is uh, is the tolerances are relatively fair. Uh, we're not talking about clockwork, uh, you know, watchmaking, um, but we're we're in the building uh, area, so we have not as high tolerances maybe let's say um, and so the flexibility of the material uh, here enables uh, the manufacturing or the production of such complex things and i think this uh, this ability to make complexity this simple um, and uh, uh, available to crafts to young crafts people is uh, very exciting and i hope that the community understands that um, we have to not not necessarily make these wild things uh, for for the the market, but we have to continue experimenting on this level, and we have to try to find a way to make these things a bit more mainstream. Not necessarily these designs, but these practices. Um, the following method here eliminates, or in quotes, I would say, eliminates uh, a need for a complex process of digital programming. Uh, humans can uh, interact with machines through digital sensors and uh, artificial intelligence. And so the robot becomes a, an extension of the human body, a kind of a new super tool um, that really is in close collaboration. This is, uh, representation is a cobot, uh, something that I've had a lot of exper uh, experience with in the past years. Um, but here's a, here's a question for you. You know, this looks handmade, doesn't it? And um, and in fact, it's a, it's a robot that carved a lot of stuff. Maybe you know the, this work from Julio, um, which I, I think is still one of the uh, more fascinating works I've seen in the past years. Uh, and each part is unique. Each piece is unique. And he achieved this by uh, using sensors, by uh, capturing motion, uh, in this case of a chisel. Uh, so the human performs the craft, uh, the sensors capture the motion, the forces, the different torques. Um, material uh, information can be uh, fed into the system, into the data. And uh, eventually the machine starts to work and uh, we can begin to assess the quality of that work and uh, a machine learning and reinforced learning process can take place. What emerges is are these new practices and these new aesthetics. So uh, instead of trying to um, model this complexity, you only need to guide motion or give ideas of what you would like to do. And the machine is capable of interacting with the material, the tool uh, in real time. So at the end of the day, cybercraft is fundamentally uh, uh, a kind of interconnection between uh, people, machines, and idea, or it networks these things. Um, some really exciting tools that I'm sure all of you also know, and um, more of them are emerging. This, in this case, the Shaper tool. It uh, allows uh, people to uh, mill large uh, uh, surfaces without uh, having to set up complex jigs and avoid uh, making mistakes. So it's a, it's a, a new form of uh, interacting with these digital uh, files and, uh, and materials and machines. So many of these things are now being made by craftsmen for craftsmen, which is the, uh, kind of a paradigm uh, before it was mainly uh, engineers making these complex tools for engineers. Now more and more craftspeople are getting involved in the practice as well. And one of the credos that we have is uh, study cybercraft, be cybercrafter. That's uh, the credo of the Cybercraft College here at the um, Regensburg, um, at the OTH, at the Regensburg School of Digital Sciences, uh, and uh, at the Faculty of Architecture and Engineering. Um, so what we think is if we shape technology uh, responsibly, the technological change is responsibly, then we can ensure that skilled trades and construction industry will continue to play a significant role in the global economy and uh, in the future and could lead to really new craftsmanship and building cultures. Um, I show this image because I have four daughters and uh, are really passionate about these kinds of tools as well. 
And I found this image on the Shaper website. I find this really cool to see um, that it's getting closer and closer and um, becoming more and more intuitive, exactly the way computation became as easy as using a, a smartphone. Um, so uh, this could be your new toolbox. These are tools. They're not substitutes for the things that you like to make. And you can choose if you want to use such tools or not. But what's nice to remember is that uh, using tools creatively, you become a craftsperson. And in this day and age, uh, you're likely to become a cyber crafter. So uh, I'm not going to show just some of the things that we're doing. We're starting to build a so-called cybercraft archive. Uh, I've been involved now uh, maybe five, six years, I would say six years um, with uh, robotics. I kind of got thrown into it and uh, through a research project. And I very quickly did, uh, discovered that it's uh, highly complicated and I wanted to begin making it as easy as possible. Um, and so I found that uh, using interfaces like uh, the robot operating system, ROS, uh, we could begin to interface different media platforms and interfaces, um, software, hardware, and intuitively begin to inform um, materials. So in this case, the first uh, application we developed was a calligraphy robot application that you could uh, use over touch media tablets large screens, small screens, et cetera. And through that project, uh, the next project that uh, came to my mind would be to, how could you scan things real time and then uh, generate a model of that uh, scan from that scan and inform it uh, immediately and, um, and have the robot process that information and make something out of it. So this application scan and form uh, allows a stereo camera on a robot either to uh, scan objects on its own in a special area. In this case, here you see on the uh, lower right side, the media interface. Um, so you can choose the areas to scan, uh, but you could also manually guide the robot to scan the, the parts. And, uh, and then when you're satisfied with the number of scans you have, you launch it and uh, we had a complex uh, meshing algorithm, uh, Poisson meshing algorithm in the background on the ROS service, all ROS-based um, uh, communications. And, uh, and then it spits it back out to the interface, and then you can start informing it. So this part here was scanned on the fly, and this data was then uh, projected onto the surface. And the robot, in this case, uh, machined this with a pen but you could begin to imagine pretty much any tool uh, being adapted. And it was quite intuitive. Uh, as you saw, the Bundeskanzler uh, back in the day was able to use it and yeah, Peter Altmaier. Here you see the interaction also between humans and machines and these different interfaces. So this was a very exciting project for me because it also helped me understand that we're dealing with a a more sophisticated environment than pure digital crafting. Um, it seems that the feedback uh, loop is, is the key behind Cybercraft. Um, and this is then the first project that we commercially um, uh, produced. Um, here, it's a scanning application for orthopedics. Uh, usually, uh, people that have disabilities need to have parts, body parts, uh, or jigs, uh, support systems made for their, their bodies. And uh, until recently, it was mainly casting uh, procedures. And here we developed a scanning um, and uh, robot milling application based on those scans. And this entire pipeline uh, is in Rhino and, um, and also RoboDK. So we developed a plugin for Rhino um, and you can just import the scan, it sets it up and uh, choose the right jig parts. Uh, and so the person just more or less has to make parts um, based on the information it's feeding or getting back from, uh, from the tool. Um, what's nice about uh, body parts is they're almost all cylindrical, so um, it's a pretty easy uh, concept actually. And a lot of fun, it was a great uh, project. 
And here you can see me and my colleagues experimenting with our own milling interface. Uh, so we were developing our own. In fact, we were lucky because it's uh, mainly finished surface milling, so we didn't have to do too much uh, uh, removal of material but um, as pre-processing. Yeah, and, and, and lately uh, we are now developing uh, at, the, at the university here, um, we developed a, an AI drawing bot um, using uh, iPad. Uh, what I try to do, what I'm really excited about is uh, mainstream uh, media. I'm not so keen on investing a lot of money, so I try to use things that are off the shelf. And we thought iPad was an, a nice uh, tool. So we just took one and we started collecting all the data from uh, drawing. And we thought drawing is something that we could port to a lot of different uh, handcraft practices. So we started with drawing. Uh, the students developed all this stuff. So this is the exciting part to see students from many different faculties. We had students from uh, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, building engineering, architecture, and I'm sure I'm missing some, um, but all uh, working on this together. And uh, what was very exciting is to see how they were hitting walls and then going further. And then we discovered that actually the process of drawing a line is very much uh, a recursive neural network type of model because you are, it's, it's actually, pure cybernetics in a way, because uh, the process of drawing a line is you kind of know where you would like to go and you have to think about it the whole time. So you're looping back and forth. You're where am I now? Where do I want to go? Where am I now? Where do I want to go? So it's a predictive uh, uh, algorithm in a way or forecasting algorithm. And that works well with the RNN. Uh, what we discovered was that uh, it would also be interesting um, to use uh, GAN, uh, so we had to take the data and we converted it into a graphical uh, visualization of the data, and then we could uh, train uh, the GAN models uh, based on that data. So we had we had two models, RNN and GAN, and then the really exciting part uh, happened uh, when the guys, uh, the students began uh, asking the question of what would happen if we uh, fuse the two models together. And we did that and we had a huge bug and then we thought about using chat GPT and it actually helped us solve the bug and that was uh, really cool. So now we're on the next stage this semester, we're going to start uh, informing brick making procedures um, based on this uh, uh, networks, neural network system, and uh, and see where this goes, because we can imagine applying it to many different practices. So that would be, I think, more or less uh, my side of the, the coin, and I'm gonna pass it over to Mark, and here you go. All right, yeah. Um, thanks, Chris, for uh, the introduction to it. Um, yeah, so now I'm just going to briefly elaborate a little bit how we came across to to use Rhino and Grasshopper and how we basically use it and utilize it for uh, the machine control. Um, originally, like I've uh, done and deducted research um, at the chair for uh, building realization and construction robotics at the uh, Technical University of Munich, and um, we had basically over the decades multi, a multitude of different machines and robots from like a various range of different manufacturers with also of course different control interfaces. And one of the major problems, uh, issues or, or challenges, however you want to call it, was that we experienced alongside the machine control um, that it was when one basically one research project with correlating hardware was ending or an employee which um, yeah, was firm or very experienced with a certain robot and a specific machine control, if one of those persons left or the research project ended, then subsequently the expertise was leading with it. So we had huge issues basically, especially for old robots to basically integrate them and to control them through, um, through a framework especially because uh, we at that time were at the Faculty of Architecture, currently civil engineering. And those um, 
yeah, students and also ourselves, um, we weren't as firm um, with uh, solutions like ROS and so on. So we basically uh, learned that over time, but especially for students to basically get them on board and so that they can operate the machines with certain use cases or projects, which we um, suggest um, that wasn't really possible. So um, furthermore, we also experienced that, yeah, in that teaching and um, machine control, we majorly had architecture and civil engineering students. So we needed also to find a solution which was basically native to construction related software. And that we don't actually end up like that, uh, just a little reference from, from Blade. Uh, runner so that we don't end up as a little machine graveyard which has a lot of like unused hardware um, that's why we could um, yeah basically at the beginning at the Technical University of Munich um, only basically teach a broader sense of uh, digital fabrication and um, therefore a lot of robots yeah eventually had to yeah unintentionally had to retire basically and we wanted to avoid that in the future, especially with a new chance, um, especially in um, col um, collaboration and correlation with Professor Lina, um, with starting a, a new opportunity, a new job here at the OTH Regensburg. So what we basically done, um, finally we swapped, uh, we already had uh, years of experience and uh, we now then proactively swapped um, our software solutions to Rhino and Grasshopper. Um, in connection to robot frameworks. Uh, a bunch of you, probably the most of you know um, a lot of that already. Um, what we um, chose as the best solution was basically HAL uh, Robotics Framework, which is a startup uh, based in London and um, basically utilizing um, yeah, the Grasshopper graphic uh, algorithm editor normally as, as you know it and enabling a machine control, which is very user-friendly and intuitively. And one of the major uh, KPIs, which basically drawn us to, to use it, was the possibility that we could integrate um, um, a lot of like different robot uh, robots into that framework. So it's basically agnostic, similar, um, similar to ROS, but we don't have to teach um, the, the students beforehand any kind of like high-level programming language necessarily. Um, we try to accelerate the usability through, through that. And here maybe just like a few um, screenshots of how we work um, with it. For instance, this example was like the last semester where we had a robotic bricklaying use case and uh, the students from the civil engineering faculty basically had to use yeah, different value lists and clusters, um, incorporating a bunch of standardized brick uh, formats and uh, various bonds. And um, for basically, um, yeah, producing, generating a flexible um, parametric machine control. And um, in addition to that, we also um, explored uh, with the students um, the possibility of integrating um, Rhino inside Revit um, a bit, because of course the IFC schema and the, um, the topic of BIM, even though, um, um, even though it's a bit far away sometimes from the field of architecture in the civil, civil engineering faculty, you just can't avoid it and have to reconsider it. And with the new pipelines, um, that, was, that was possible as well. So here, another little example, um, one of the little um, desktop robots basically, which we purchased. Um, a couple of months ago, which Hull um, helped us to, to integrate. And we could then um, subsequently use it for, for uh, several use cases and in teaching purposes, doesn't matter if it's just for drawing or if it's for um, simple pick and place use cases. And there you can see just a little example of how also um, with um, Gantry kinematic on the left side with a 3D printer with a very simple G-code, um, which we could also produce through Grasshopper. Um, we basically made the pipeline from planning to actual digital fabrication in a smaller scale, and thereby also introducing robot-oriented design to basically um, tweak the, the part um, in accordance to the machine we're using for, for the fabrication. So yeah, um, now maybe a very quick um, overview about what is currently in the making. Um, since the project started um, a couple of uh, months ago now. So we're currently like developing our, our labs um, to, 
Okay, now it's swapping uh, our labs. And uh, this one there, you can basically see little kind of like miniature um, assembly lines, which we're trying to, um, to, um, to teach the students with Grasshopper and that little 4-axis robot, um, including several sensors, like a little vision system. In the background, you can see a little 3D printer. On the left, a few uh, UAVs. And um, that whole setup, we um, basically could link um, to Grasshopper and make it possible for the students to have a yeah, easy interface to um, yeah, elaborate various, uh, various applications. And alongside that, of course, on the basement, um, on the on the ground floor, you have uh, yeah a bunch of industrial um, industrial robots, um, which of course the students um, in the near future should also then use in accordance with us for research purposes. That before was the civil engineering faculty, and that is now located the CC cave um, in the basement of the architecture faculty. And there you can also see just like a brief uh, image of how that is developing at the moment with also a few uh, cooker industrial robots, a little CNC on the left side, as well as our like a big Yaskaba dual arm robot. Uh, I think we already named it Hulk if I'm not mistaken. So I think that suits to the proportion uh, of the actual robot and what it can do and also the payload. So um, research outlook and discussion. So there are basically two little um, projects we are currently working on, which we want to realize as kind of like pilot projects. Because um, in general, when we collaborate with a handcraft, um, it is always a challenge to basically get them, first of all, to understand the technology part of it. But for us, of course, to actually get the needs of the handcraft in a bottom-up approach. So that's why um, those two pilot projects should basically um, yeah, serve as, um, as a showcase for a workshop we're planning on doing in autumn this year. The first example is basically a little historic um, timber joinery. So in general, those um, timber joineries, they um, require special attention during uh, yeah, renovation and especially restoration. And in particular, that uh, restoration of damaged uh, building components um, presents a challenge. Um, in terms of uh, the craftsmanship. And usually those um, damaged um, components are removed and replaced um, by locally adapted ones. And um, that requires uh, very trained and um, specialized carpenters. And in the targeted process, which you can see on the slide, um, the old components are firstly 3D scanned. Um, then the data is uh, forwarded uh, for the actual preparation. Um, with a parametric 3D model, which is derived from the scan, and subsequently, of course, the um, robotic fabrication um, with a milling end effector um, can happen uh, for the historic timber construction. And that just gives a nice little um, use case, which um, shows how um, that handcraft and um, that digital fabrication can work side by side. And the second example, which I just quickly want to show, we're currently um, on it to, um, to get it started, is um, this one, which is a construction of um, staircases made of uh, reinforced concrete. And the production, as well as the um, construction, um, especially of um, spiral staircases, which you can see on the, in the left image, uh, made out of um, reinforced concrete is a yeah, very unique challenge. And especially the production of um, that um, stair form work um, is very complex and requires, again, very special expertise um, in the actual implementation. And the intended process here is basically starting with modular um, semi-finished parts on the left side, which are derived from a parametric 3D model and um, of the actual staircase, and then manufactured via 3D concrete printing. And those modules basically serve as formwork for, um, yeah, for on-site concreting and form a kind of like a, a hybrid structure with uh, the inside to concrete and reinforcing steel. So yeah, I think that's from me. And I would hand over to Sebastian now, which is, uh, yeah, who is going to dig a bit more deeper into, into practice now. Okay. 
Yes, hi. I, I hope you can uh, handle a little bit more information from me. I just want to shortly show you some showcases on 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 different levels where uh, I already worked on on fusing handcraft with digital crafts uh, together with handcrafters uh, in the last years. Um, I can switch. Ah, here. So, um, starting 10 years ago in the movie industry, uh, I was, uh, I had the great opportunity to, to found the 3D lab with all the new digital toys like uh, scanning systems, 3D printers, uh, CNC hardware cutting machines, and also a cuckoo robot for, for milling. And there was a first contact with uh, the, the hand sculptors. So, and uh, they came to me and said, oh, you are the robot man, okay, you are the enemy killing our jobs. And I told them, no, I'm not killing your job. I mean, it's just a, a useful tool also for you to get uh, other kind of jobs or speeding up some processes. So there was this project for a foundation where we had to build bisons, seven, seven pieces. And that, so, so um, I, I could have milled them all, um, but they would have looked all exactly the same and also with um, these milling artifacts. So we decided to, to come together to fuse digital craft and handcraft. Let's say we, uh, we just used Rhino for implementing the scan and just cutting the outline with a hot wire cutting machine and also um, mirroring uh, four of them. And then um, we invited seven different sculptors to just say here, okay, we made all the, the pre-work for you, uh, the ugly pre-work, and now you can show your art to sculpt your own bison out of it. And in the end, uh, we were able to show a, a family of bisons, but all looking a little bit different. So I think this is very low level showing uh, the advantage of combining digital craft and uh, craft. So in another project I've done uh, in uh, 2021 was um, the movie Uncharted for Sony. So I was there at Prop Designer and we had this big light sculpture. And the light, the light sculpture uh, was made out of very long light pipes and it uh, should look like a big uh, chandelier. And um, I had to make it very easy for the production designer to, to change the design. So every light pipe was just made out of one point in grasshopper and everything changed according to the movement of the points, also the table lines, the dimensions, all the information we needed also for manufacturing. Here that you see that it was used for sound. So, and what we additionally have done is we invited the director and the, the main actor and uh, got some hololenses. And we went to the building where the set uh, um, was shoot it afterwards, and we tested on each floor the, the the proportions of the light sculpture as well as the distances to the pipe for the stunt, and that was a pretty amazing process to see the, the sculpture we want to build in, in the right scale, and um, we had all these measurements. So another project was, uh, I met a company, I worked uh, before uh, a concrete company in Potsdam, and uh, we, we just got in talk to each other because they had a research project and they invested in a, in a robotic cell. And we talked about robotics a lot, but the first thing we've done is they shopped me their facility. And in the end, um, they are building uh, the most of the job. They are doing simple shapes like rectangular shapes or um, uh, simple curved um, uh, objects. And what they told me is that one man, uh, it, it, it takes one man uh, around one to two hours to create all the foam work for each piece you see here on the picture. And also another half an hour to to flatten it and to prepare it for the milling process. So I told them, hey, for this, uh, you can use uh, 
it's not necessarily rules that you do for the for the phone work. So they told me about the rules of making the phone work, and I told them, okay, I can make the script for you. So we had the deal that I had to make the script for them, but also teaching them Rhino and Grasshopper to enable them to, to make scripts on their own and also um, 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 change some, some settings in, in the script. So to understand Rhino as well as Grasshopper, but not only using uh, um, ready-made software. And for sure, you can make a proper software out of it, but it was just about, so when you make a, a proper software, you, you should have enough clients that it's worse to do this job. In this case, it was fine to just handle the rest of the script. And uh, so what we did was, uh, by just giving the curve, we created all the phone work, and you have a lot of things you can change. And also, everything is uh, flattened and nested so that they can move all the shapes out of the uh, Multiplex uh, to, to make the phone work. So we speeded up the process. So another project I'm, I'm still working on is position. So I think, I think most of you know the process incremental sheet forming. And uh, it's it's very interesting for the industry, um, for, for aircraft, for automotive industry, but it's also very interesting for handcraft. So I don't know if you know this instrument here, it's called a uh, hand pan or hand. It's uh, in, in, invited, uh, not invited, in, invented by a um, Swiss, uh, Swiss art, um, artist, and it's a sound sculpture. And it takes uh, very long to sculpt this, um, this, uh, this instrument. And that's why it's also very expensive, like starting from 1000 euro going up to six, 7,000. And I found, uh, um, I met a musician also making these instruments. And we said, okay, let's combine the skill of the robot with your skill of, of hammering this form. And now we're currently working on um, using incremental sheet forming as well as machine hammer peening to test different shapes and also trying to implement AI to reference uh, the sound to the shape and maybe um, enable us to, to create new sounds or, or shapes or in the end instruments. So here you see just a very random grass of a setup using Kuka PLC, thanks to Jonas Brauman, just a very nice tool. And um, the last um, showcase I would show you is so maybe is some of you know by right. checking the magnet form that some guys already tried to parameterize this robot thing by just implementing uh, a photo grasshopper and creating a, a scribble drawing out of it. And I, I also wanted to do it for 10 years now, but never found the right strategy. And I don't want to show these circle drawings or anything like that. What, what we wanted to create is a script we don't see in the first moment that it's created by an uh, algorithm. And in the end, um, we wanted to draw it with a robot. So we want to show, okay, it, it, it was it made by a human or was it made by a machine? So we, we, we tested another approach and uh, it was fine enough for the moment. And um, we put it on the robot and uh, draw some, uh, made some drawings. But then we recognized, uh, realized that the process in Grasshopper was taking too long. It was just about two to three minutes for each drawing to create. And also it's not the right, the right user interface to handle it to, to humans uh, who don't know anything about Grasshopper or Rhino. So we wanted to make a simple user interface. Well, it's fine for you, Florian. I, I took your picture to, to show our web app. Sure, sure, go ahead. So we created this web app, very simple to use. Everybody can just upload a pic and create its own drawing out of it. And this is based on JavaScript. So we could, so we translated the the logic we created in Grasshopper, translated it uh, to JavaScript and speeded up the process. 
so that's not the point to use it very easily and intuitively. Yes, and, and the point is uh, um, if you if you click on scribble it, each image will come. Uh, will be completely different. So the, the script is generating always a new picture, but the, the feeling of the picture is always the same, but uh, always new curves. So, and then we went to some exhibitions uh, here in Germany to show the process um, to the visitors. So what we wanted to show in the first row is, we wanted to show the other companies that we can also move a robot, but, for us, we can show a million different movements, just um, and not just like always the same three, four accurate movements. And also for the normal visitors who think, oh, the robot is the enemy. We wanted to give them a very simple tool to show. It's a tool also for you. And there we can create a, a very simple connection for you to program the robot directly by just um, giving a photo of you. And that's it for my side. So we made, uh, so we got in contact with uh, um, a lot of people and uh, yeah, created some happy faces in the end. Yeah, thanks from my side. And I will give back to Chris. Okay, so um, I hope uh, you can hear me. So what's next? Uh, we We have um, founded the Cybercraft Institute, which is actually a nonprofit organization trying to network industry with academia and politics, because it's clear to us this, that um, if we want these things to go more mainstream, we need uh, political uh, power behind it. And um, at the moment, we've developed relationships here in Bavaria with the uh, uh, Handcraft Association and uh, politics. We are being funded um, the Cybercraft College here on the OTH, and um, and the institute is uh, is now enabling the Handcraft Association. We are trying to consult uh, handcrafters, and actually the the key to all of this would be to network you guys, the digital crafters, with the handcrafters together. So. Our uh, call is to to join us, uh, and we uh, we invite you to visit the website. And if you wish to become members and support the project, uh, one of the aspects is that we'll help uh, network things, um, and, and then in the long term, we'll be sharing the archive. Uh, so a lot of uh, exciting stuff is now happening um, because of all the parts coming together. So yeah, I, I would just like, I think we all want to say thank you. And, uh, and now Cybercraft, have fun. Feel free to ask questions if you have some thoughts. Thank you guys, great presentation. And yes, we have five uh, minutes on. if uh, someone needs to or wants to ask uh, anything. I have been checking the chat and it's been quiet, but yeah, I'm checking if everything is working and it looks it's okay. Probably just too much input. That's okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, Renee is saying thank you. Great presentation. And yeah, I really like the, all the well, all the the instruments that you are using because it's not just a, a Google robot; it's uh, also holograph lens. Uh, I don't know. So you have to to learn many machines. Also, Rhino, Grasshopper. Um, well, it's a, a full level of uh, capacities that I think it's re re very complex, right? Well, yeah. The the thing is, um, that's the that's the that's the really exciting part. Actually, um, I mean, our long term vision is uh, is hopefully to to work more with platforms so that we can. Uh, I was really happy, for instance, recently to see Compass is going full fledged. Uh, mm -hmm. 
at ETH and um, and uh, I mean I'm a huge fan of Ross um, and so these kinds of platforms enable us to connect um, devices and what we're doing here at the lab is um, we are now using OPC UA uh, and hopefully we'll begin connecting the two labs we'll start connecting the labs with external labs and um, and experimenting with platform technologies so that we can decentralize manufacturing. That would be our goal is form hybrid manufacturing, micro manufacturing. And so basically you're just shoveling data around and have skilled crafts local and produce things locally as much as possible. So in the long term, that's our goal um, where we want to go with this stuff. But yeah, it's super complex, and but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, very nice presentation um, from Stefan. But yeah, yeah, cool. I'm reading the chat too. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks to all of you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and and, and as I said, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm probably speaking for for all the members here that are. Um, but yeah, uh, go to the website. There's a newsletter. You can uh, subscribe there. You don't have to become a member, but you you can subscribe. And if you want to become a member. We we try to help everybody we can. Um, so yeah, um, that's quite a quite an exciting time for us uh, to see what's going on at the, at the moment. Okay, great. Well, thank you, then very much for the presentation. It has been great, and I You're hope welcome. to see you in some conferences or webinars and meet yeah. you in person. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, and uh, we uh, we're going to be kicking off the lab in the next weeks because we're still we we pulled all the parts together. Now we we received all our funding last uh, at the end of the year, and yeah. so it's taken some time. But now everything is going very quickly, and so um, we'll be really happy to have people visit us uh, at the labs as well here, because the two labs are very different from one another. The building building guys are building guys, and we're we're crafters, and we're trying to to see how, because we have also an industrial design department. So we're trying to see how that will impact um, some of the ideas that we have. And um, and then, yeah, um, the practice of making architecture, uh, we're also exploring ideas there. Um, but right now the main strategy is to, to work a lot more with this AI um, and, and um, seeing how how the two practices can work side by side. So. The, for instance, the brick lay, the brick thing that we're yep. going to be doing this semester, we'll we'll have uh, one test case where humans are informing the bricks using Hololens and uh, shaping these th these new brick structures for facades, and then we'll have uh, not not laying the bricks, but really shaping the clay before it gets uh, burned, and um, and parallel this uh, intuitive robotic uh, application to inform the brick. So uh, I hope that we'll discover uh, what what makes more sense or doesn't make more sense. We'll, we'll find out a lot of stuff, I hope, uh, out of this experiment. Yeah. All right, thanks. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. Have a Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.